Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Safe Reaches webinar. We will get started in a couple more minutes while people continue to join. Thank you. All right, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning again. This is uh, Kostu Jacktap or KJ. I'm a product marketer, ma marketer here at Safe Reach, and I wanted to thank you all for taking the time to attend our interactive session today. Uh, before we get started, I do want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all the registrants and the attendees after the webinar is complete. At any given point of time, if you have any questions about the content or the Safe Reach product, please send them to us via the Q&A function. We shall be answering all the questions during the Q&A uh, session towards the end. Also, since this is a truly interactive webinar, we will be using live polling during this presentation to understand your perspective. Avi, uh, do you mind going to the next slide for a second? Sure. So as I mentioned, uh, since this is an interactive webinar, I wanted to ask the audience to open up uh, the link that you see over here, pollev.com uh, and enter safe breach or pollev.com forward slash safe breach. Or you can also text safe breach to 22333. And uh, once Avi comes to the, the, the particular slide that has the question, that should automatically populate on your screen. So uh, please do take a couple of uh, seconds to kind of uh, go to this website. That way we can have a truly interactive uh, webinar uh, and Avi can share his uh, perspective on those questions as well. But with, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on the role of breach and attack simulation solutions in cybersecurity compliance. Compliance has always been a critical part of any organization, but nowadays with security controls getting so much attention, uh, validating security controls has become a key part of uh, compliance requirements. But this has given rise to uh, differing opinions on what is the best way to test controls. Is it uh, point in time testing like pen testing or red, uh, red teaming, or is it continuous validation using BAS solutions? And, and, and more importantly, or most importantly, the, the critical question is how does this really affect or uh, allow an organization to comply with the, the industry compliance re regulations and requirements? Our speaker today is uh, SafeBreach CISO, Avishai Avi Avivi, or he goes by Avi. Uh, he has over three decades of information security experience, having held multiple leadership roles at large enterprises, including Wells Fargo, E-Trade, Experian. Uh, his career spans multiple roles and domains across uh, information security, including product research uh, and development, professional services, customer support, consulting, uh, and, and strategic leadership. He holds a dual MBA from uh, the Berkeley Has Has School of Business and Columbia University uh, Business School. And in addition to uh, all the awesome stuff that he's done, he has all the letters that you can imagine uh, ahead of him. He's a CISSP, CISM, CRISC, et cetera, et cetera. And he also holds the Stanford University Strategic Decision and Risk Management Program Certification. Um, Avi, over to you. Thanks, KJ. Uh, so just a quick mention, if you want, uh, you can scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen and connect to me via LinkedIn. Uh, I'd be happy to um, answer any follow-up questions you may have later on or really on any topic you want to discuss. Uh, as KJ said, this is how you can join the uh, uh, interactive polling. You don't have to, but obviously it makes it a little bit more interesting. Uh, I don't know about you folks, but the, this pandemic and doing all these virtual sessions can get a little bit uh, uh, routine. And so to kind of keep the engagement going, uh, I'd like to use this polling. So just a, a quick icebreaker. Um, let's do the first uh, poll, you know, and it's already started. People started answering, which is great. Uh, this is a multiple choice. So, you know, you can answer more than one or select more than one uh, particular 
uh, value. So uh, let's uh, give people a chance to respond. So it looks like for at least some people, uh, it is uh, uh, working. Uh, you know, right now I'm not seeing how many uh, total responses we have, but we can see that uh, people are responding. So that's good. And we can get started. So as, as KJ said, our, our industry is really uh, filled with um, these compliance standards and rules and regulations that we need to follow, kind of ticking the box, if you will. And um, one of the things that I want to try and, and convey with this presentation, at the very least, is the notion that the spirit of the law or the spirit of the compliance is uh, more important than the letter of it. So I use uh, quotes from two luminaries, uh, Attila de Hun and Steven Seagal. Uh, you know, they certainly got it, right? I mean, at the end of the day, and the example I like to use is some compliance uh, frameworks, uh, I won't name the specific framework basically says you need to do a third party penetration test at least once a year. Now, technically, if you wanted to, you can just ask your neighbor's kid to you know, use their Raspberry Pi to run an Animap scan against your uh, uh, external uh, space. And technically that would count if you go by the letter of the compliance, technically that would count as fulfilling that requirement because it is a third party that's running some sort of penetration test against your environment. Now, is that what the framework uh, calling for? Arguably not, but I, again, depending on how you wanna tick that box, is it, are you ticking it that you fulfilled the letter of the compliance or are you ticking it to show that you complied with the spirit of the compliance framework? So I'm gonna bring up this picture and it's interesting, uh, you know, there's, there's a bit of a, uh, an age thing as to how you recognize this picture. Um, so if you don't recognize it, this is the famous or infamous uh, Titanic. And as you may well know, over um, a thousand people died uh, on the night that Titanic hit the iceberg. Now, barring the iceberg, and this is our first real poll, barring the iceberg, what was the actual reason for the loss of life? Or, or were, was the Titanic really compliant with the maritime regulations at that time? So really three options here, right? Uh, clearly not because so many people died, clearly there were not enough lifeboats. Uh, or yes, actually, they had the exact number required for a ship greater than 10,000 tons, or C, they actually exceeded the requirements. So I'm gonna give people some uh, time to respond. So far we have uh, one or two. I would say this is probably at least three answers. Give it a couple more seconds. So the answer is really uh, C, they actually exceeded the requirements. Now, kind of the, there, there's a bunch of factors that led to what happened that night, but really the, the maritime regulations for that time were outdated. They didn't account for the newer and larger sh passenger ships. So, you know, technically, if you go by that, the letter of the requirement, uh, at the time, there were only several classes of, of uh, passenger ships, and really the last class was any ship over 10,000 pounds, uh, 10,000 tons, rather. Um, but Titanic was over 40,000 tons. So it was way, way over what was uh, imagined as a size of, of a passenger ship. And so the, the lifeboat count that was required, 16, 
uh, was clear enough. The original plan of Titanic, Titanic was actually um, to have 64 lifeboats, but what happened was the, the uh, owners said, hey, you're really killing our um, deck views, so we really don't want to have 64 since we only need 16. The designer came back and said, okay, then how about we do it, you know, let's compromise, let's do 32. And um, the owners again said, hey, no, we, we, we don't want 32, even that is too much. We want, you know what, we'll, let, let's compromise, we'll do 20. The designer resigned as a result of that because they thought this was clearly not enough. Now, the other thing is there was a certain hubris by the owners saying, hey, this is an unsignable ship. The only reason we're going to need lifeboats is really to ferry passengers back and forth from a possibly stranded Titanic, but still afloat, to the uh, rescue ships or whatever ships were be used to get the passengers away from the Titanic. Then the, the other factor is they only had one lifeboat drill. Just think about that. So the, the crew had no idea how to, to really deploy all the lifeboats because in that one lifeboat drill that they did, which was done at port, by the way, only used two lifeboats out of the full complement of 20. And then the last but not least was that at the actual night of the event, they weren't sure if uh, the lifeboats could actually hold the 60 people that they were supposedly designed to carry. So they thought that they might buckle. And as a result, some of them were only loaded with 30 people instead of 60. So, you know, all of these factors uh, put together really meant that there were not enough boats, crew didn't know how to deploy them. The, um, as a, and, and two lifeboats were completely unused. And then of the lifeboats that were used, they were not uh, uh, properly uh, uh, filled. So, you know, uh, a quote that I like to use is, is from Michael Mead that a false sense of security is the only kind of reason there is. Now, I know pandemic has impacted our travel, but if you've ever flown uh, in, in the US and certainly around the world, you've heard this statement or something to that uh, tone, right? In case of an unlikely event of an emergency water landing, you may find a flotation device beneath your seat cushion. So kind of the next picture I'd like to bring up as a story is the, the following one. And if you recognize it, this is Miracle on the Hudson. Uh, Captain, Captain Solly, uh, had to uh, perform an emergency water landing in the Hudson. Uh, there were 150 passengers on board. They all got out alive, uh, and uh, including, uh, in addition to the five crew members. So our, our next poll, right? Of the 150 passengers, how many do you think actually managed to get out with their life jackets? All an opportunity to respond. Great, so uh, the, the real answer is uh, only about, or not only about, exactly 33 people got their life jackets out. So think about that. That's, that's even though you know where the uh, life jacket is, uh, 33 people were managed to get it out. But then following on that, of the 33 people that did get their life jackets out, how many actually wore them correctly? Because as part of that demonstration, they show you how you put it on, you back all those, those uh, stra straps, how to inflate it, if it doesn't auto inflate, et cetera. Okay, so the actual answer is really uh, only four people. So of the, 150 passengers, only 33 people got the, the life jackets out. And of those 33, only four 
floor them correctly, basically uh, buckling the, uh, the straps around their waist. And why do I bring this up? This is really about you know, validating your security control, right? How do you know, it's not enough to just have the controls, how do you know that they'll actually function correctly in case of a real event, right? We've all seen those jackets. We know that they're there. We've all seen the demonstration on how to use it, but yet at a time of emergency, less than you know, less than five people actually were able to get that done the whole way through. And so, really talking about testing, right? And one of the things that we were trying to to understand is how do we actually do uh, a test that is representative of an actual situation. So yet another uh, question. Do you consider yourself to be a normal or average person? Three options, no wrong answer, or there's depending on your, on your point of view. There's answers that are uh, more relevant. I do like to think that some people are extraordinary in, in certain, certainly in certain aspects. Um, but at the end of the day, really the, uh, the answer is from the point of view of testing, there is no such thing as a normal person. If you've watched, um, you know, the Grammy award winning um, special by Bo Burnham, he has a saying that the average person has one fallopian too, which is somewhat correct if you think about the fact that, you know, roughly half of the population is uh, female, therefore the average number of fallopian tubes is one per person. You've all seen this type of, uh, of dummy, right? This is a test crash dummy, right? Uh, or crash test dummy. So the, the really car manufacturers use these primarily to test their security controls, right? The airbags, the uh, seat belts, et cetera. So obviously the, the problem that car manufacturers have when they come up with a new control, let's say a new seat belt design or a new location for an airbag, they don't really have a way of realistically testing that control without encouraging risk. I mean, you, you can't use real people, obviously, because you don't know how that control is gonna function. So, you know, the, the government had instituted that all um, car manufacturers need to use a crash test dummy. Now, what not a lot of people know or realize is that um, this dummy has really been standardized in the, uh, in the 70s. And basically it's based on 170 pound man that's five, uh, five foot nine, which I don't know about you. I'm, you know, even on my best days, I'm not 170 pounds and I'm slightly taller than, than five foot nine. Right. But it, it gets even more concerning that just based on a, a recent study by uh, University of Virginia that showed that in case of a uh, of an accident where there was fatalities, uh, female drivers had 17 percent more likely chance of dying than male counterparts. And that's because really there's a different uh, there's different bone density. The women are typically smaller in stature than that five foot nine, 170 pound man. And so they tend to sit closer to the, um, to the steering wheel. All kinds of factors join in to make it uh, a lot different. And so when you see a five-star rating, safety rating, keep in mind that that five-star safety rating is specifically for a five foot nine, 170 pound man. Again, why do I bring this story up is because when we test our security controls, how do we know that we're testing them with real life conditions, right? And so what our industry has done is really bring up penetration tests. Arguably, those penetration tests where we leverage typically or hopefully a third party uh, company will use ethical hackers to deploy real attacks against your environment. Now, our contention is that that in itself is not enough. And so 
one quote that I like, and, and this is, if you know the, um, uh, the Maginot line, it's often used as an example of a, a really a, a failed defense or, or a bad defensive line. The reality of it is that this quote was actually uh, said about three years before the inv invasion. You know, the, the, there's no way that uh, the, the uh, French were able to deploy Maginot line across the entire uh, border of, of France and, and Germany. And just the cost was, was outrageous. And if you think back to your security portfolio, you cannot deploy the same set of controls across your entire environment, right? All the, all the segments, et cetera. And so the problem is that what happened during the actual invasion is the Germans went through a route that the French, uh, French didn't think they would. They went north of the Maginot Line in a terrain that was slightly more hostile uh, naturally, but didn't have any of the advanced defenses of the Maginot Line. So when we talk about penetration testing, if you look, there's an there's a interesting report by uh, Cobalt uh, called The State of Pen Testing 2021, not to be confused with their more, most recent test uh, state report. This one specifically talked about scoping and running penetration testing, right? So only 61% or not only 61% of the organization had difficulties even scoping. If you think about our cloud environment and how we have micro segmentation, it's really hard to scope the full level of the test. And even if you do, 58% of those polled agree that it was just too expensive with 42% saying it's, it's, they just can't afford a full penetration test, let alone multiple ones. They'll only do once a year uh, at best, right? And on average, uh, the, the enterprise said that they only tested 63% of their application and network portfolio. So if you think about it, they basically said, yes, we have a marginal line that we tested and that marginal line spreads across 63% of our environment. We don't know what happens with the rest of, our, of the 37%. So a quick poll, you know, um, how often do you test your environment? You know, how many times do you do penetration testing? Okay. So kind of the, the standard best practice is at least annually or when you have a significant change, but that's it. It's a standard practice. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a hard rule. Okay, good. So, and there's there's no wrong or right answer. This is really more to see where people stand. So, want to call your uh, uh, attention to to you know considering the fact that we cannot just rely on. Or, or, or do it annually or when there's an internal change. We really also think about the external environment. In information security, our external threat environment is constantly evolving. And in February, 2021, this happened, right? We had abnormally cold temperatures that led to massive failure of the Texas power grid. And we can talk about causes and, and issues, but at the end of the day, those power generation facilities were working fine. There was no change to their configuration. What happened was an external change, a new threat, or arguably a, a, a known threat happened. Temperatures dropped, froze some of the power generation facilities, and people died. And that is because of an external change, not an internal one. So, Getting close to the end, because I want to make sure we have time for uh, questions, but basically one of the things that is that we're trying to say is it's important to prepare. It's important to run as close as possible uh, 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 attack simulations against your environment um, and, and make sure you're ready. Make sure that when an attacker tries to come after your network, a real attacker, they'll fail. And having that data and being able to relay it to your board or executive layer 
is really important. You know, we've seen the supply chain attacks and, you know, you may have a log chain vulnerability, uh, uh, me, uh, log4j vulnerability. Can you actually prove that your environment can withstand an attack against it? So just want to put everything together. Um, you know, compliance frameworks are a great start. They're not the destination. It's a way of thinking through your entire environment but really make sure that you abide by the spirit of the compliance framework and not the letter of it. Changes to our internal environment are not the only reason to uh, uh, do a test. External threat landscape is very important. And then one thing that I didn't touch a lot on is having a single component, that log4j as an example in a single server you know, that you discover through a vulnerability assessment doesn't mean that your entire environment uh, is runnable. You need to be able to uh, check your entire environment for uh, how it withstands a specific attack. Quick action items. We really urge you to test your controls and not assume that they're correctly configured for your environment. We want you to test those controls under real attack conditions, which also leads into test them just like a hacker will test them, not some artificial or synthetic attack. You know, don't just run an ICAR file and see if, uh, if your AV detects it because every AV will, uh, should detect an ICAR file. Then the other thing is, again, the Maginot Line, simulate them throughout your entire environment. Don't assume that just your production network is the one that will be under attack. If someone comes in through your office, can they do a lateral movement across your environment and get into your production environment? Can they hop to your dev and then from your dev environment into your production? Then the other thing is make sure that your testing is up to date on the current threat landscape. Again, the external threat landscape is constantly evolving, constantly new attacks. You wanna make sure that the attacks are updated, the attacks that you're simulating are updated to reflect that. And then finally, and I'm gonna close and turn over to questions is, uh, make sure that you, you test as often as you can and not just wait for a year to go by. So with that, uh, let's move over to Q&A. Thanks, Avi, <clears throat> sure. for that insightful presentation. I, we did receive a few questions here. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation towards the end that uh, test for the threat landscape, does that mean that test against real payloads or, or, or can or does BAS allow you to test for real payloads? So yeah, so so the 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 answer is yes. The BAS uh, and it depends on the platform. I, I usually keep my uh, presentation somewhat vendor agnostic, but um, yeah, you definitely want to use uh, uh, a platform that allows you to test real payloads, but do it securely or do it safely in a way that doesn't really introduce uh, potential risk to your environment. So. Uh, for example, ransomware, you, you want to test how your system will respond to ransomware without actually deploying ransomware across your uh, environment. Thanks. Um, are, do you feel in your opinion and your experience, uh, are BAS tools gaining uh, more widespread acceptance as the primary tools to ensure uh, compliance, uh, that organizations comply with the regulations? Uh, are they replacing red teams, uh, red teaming pen testing or uh, pen testing and red teaming are still kind of the primary tool? So that, that's a good question. I think there's there's a couple of, of, uh, of portions for that question. Number one is they are certainly getting more uh, acceptance. I mean, if you've seen the recent uh, um, financial regulation, uh, we actually have a blog uh, entry about that where organizations are being asked to report within 36 hours of an attack on whether or not they're, uh, they've been breached. And really, is that enough time for an organization to respond? And so one of the things we, we, we see happening is customers leveraging BAS tools to know exactly how their environment reacts and make sure that all the, the controls are configured correctly so that they can comply with the 36 hour window. Uh, now, as far as can it replace pen testing and, and red teaming, this is, it's a bit of a loaded question, right? BAS tools can de definitely be a force multiplier, right? At the end of the day, a, a tool will never be a complete replacement for a person. 
And so if your organization is not, uh, uh, doesn't have enough resources or, or is not able to really execute those at scale, then yeah, you can use BAS as a sort of a replacement. But if you do have a, a penetration test and you do have, um, uh, or you do have a, a red team, you can then take the, the BAS platform and leverage it as a force multiplier to, uh, to actually run that attack at scale, meaning across your entire environment. So leverage the, the insight and the skill of your red team to build an attack that is sophisticated and then use BAS to run it across your entire environment rather than wasting their time on weaponizing it. Thank you. And uh, the last question that we have for today is how can security executives uh, and compliance officers leverage results from BAS tests to convey uh, the organizational, overall organizational compliance with regulations uh, to the board or any key stakeholders? Because going forward, you know, it, it's been now reported in the uh, SEC forums or everything uh, that, that get, gets public. So can BAS tools allow that level of reporting that can show yeah. that we comply with? Yes, uh, absolutely. So if you think about it, uh, and then just ref let's refer to, to NIST as, as one of these frameworks, just the fact that you're using BAS uh, pretty much covers all the uh, security control validation family in NIST. So any of the SC controls under that family uh, is covered. Just by running, you can actually leverage uh, uh, BAS to do IR exercises and training for the SOC uh, personnel, which in itself is a, is a compliance requirement. So you can use the platform for more than just breach attack simulation. And we have multiple use cases and I'm sure we'd be very happy to discuss them with you if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Avi. Uh, that is it, everybody. That's the time we have for today. Uh, again, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for taking the time to attend this webinar. As I mentioned previously, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with uh, the attendees as well as the registrants. Uh, if you do have any follow-up questions, please do visit our website and there is a contact us form where you can specify what kind of help that you might need. Thank you again and have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.